even as we are connected to the internet all of the time, so will all the physical objects in our life. This is something that, particularly in your industry, you're probably already quite familiar with, but the idea of smart objects, of the smart sensors integrated into absolutely every device you can think of and then connected to the internet. It turns out that it's very inexpensive now to create a sensor t smaller than a baby's fingernail that can measure anything from heat to alkalinity to humidity, pressure, and combine that with another chip that's as small as a baby's fingernail, and that is a radio that connects to the internet and put these together in a package that, again, is so tiny that you almost don't see it. And what's interesting is I describe these tiny sensors with their tiny radios, and the first thing that any engineer in the crowd will say is, OK, who changes the batteries in these tiny radios? It's a good question. They don't generally need batteries. They use a new technology called energy harvesting. They actually are so efficient that well, my favorite example is a, is a sensor that's already being used in new bridge construction. It's a sensor that detects icing long before even humans could see that icing is taking place on the surface of a bridge and sends out an internet signal on the radio. Um, that sensor is entirely powered by the flexing of the bridge as tires go over it. That's all the energy it needs. There's, there's a new medical product that will be out by the end of the year, which is effectively a heart monitor in a Band-Aid. Uh, you put a Band-Aid on a patient. They wear it for 24 hours. Um, it monitors their heart rate and a couple of other pieces of information as well for 24 hours. Uh, wirelessly, it connects to whatever internet connection they have in their house, and then the data is sent on to the doctor or the hospital. Um, and it's so inexpensive that at the end of the 24 hours, you just throw it away. It's disposable. It's entirely powered by the heat of your body. So most of these sensors require no other source of power other than the environment that they're in. So you can begin to put sensors on all kinds of things, even infrastructure that already exists. My favorite example recently of how you can take existing infrastructure and make it smarter, something I ran into in Italy of all places. Now, I don't normally go to Italy for high technology, but I saw this use of smart sensors there. In Italy, and much of Europe, there's a big premium on making garbage collection efficient. Because those of you who've driven in the old cities know the streets are about this wide, right? Completely freaks out Americans. They're such narrow streets. Uh, the problem is when you collect garbage, the garbage truck stops, it stops the whole town. There's no way to get around it. So in these towns, there's a premium on garbage collection. So a European consortium has invented the smart dumpster. And it's very simple. It's a couple of sensors on this dumpster. Um, one measures the amount of trash in the dumpster. The garbage truck approaches. It radios ahead, says, hi, dumpster. I'm on my way. The dumpster says, I'm only a quarter full. Don't bother picking me up today. Or I'm almost full. You better pick me up. So efficiency is right there. Um, there's also another sensor that, through ultrasonics, can kind of tell what's in the dumpster at any given time. So if the dumpster, for example, all of a sudden fills up with used wallboard, it sends a signal to headquarters that some contractor is doing illegal dumping, and you better get out there and do something about it. So this has already it created these incredible efficiencies in garbage collection, simply having these two sensors on uh, dumpsters. So I say, if you can make dumpsters intelligent, you've got a technology with some real potential. NASA has just finished a great building in Silicon Valley that has got a lot of intelligence based on smart sensors. Well, actually, one thing that the building does is really clever. The building actually pays attention to the weather report. And in Silicon Valley, for those of you who've been there, it can get very hot in the summer, but then fog will come in over the coastal hills maybe two or three nights out of the week. What the building can do is actually pay his attention to the weather forecasts, and if the fog is coming over, it opens all the high windows completely around the building to bring in that cool air and then closes them when the fog goes back out. But what's interesting inside in terms of energy conservation is that everyone at NASA has badges. They have smart badges with tiny sensors. So the building actually tracks how many people are in any given room and adjusts the temperature accordingly. It turns the air conditioning up, it turns it down. 
The next generation of software that they're putting in will be connected into the building's calendaring system. So it will actually be able to look at the calendars of everyone in that building and say, oh, 25 people are going to be in this conference room in another half hour. I will start cooling it down 10 minutes in advance.